Okay, well, here's that American Eagle with the DT-466 in it. And I had to get some help here, and hopefully we're strong enough to get this hood off. I don't really know if there's anywhere. I wonder if I can run a strap through that. I wonder if I can run a strap through that. Yeah, the whole right. Through the center right. right there. Without tearing it up. And at least it'll help us get it off. Yeah. I gotta take these two bolts out, or four bolts out. There's two on each side, and then slide, I think. Slide that ahead. Yeah, yeah this, this thing should slide ahead. Let me get those bolts out of there. Let's get a crane hooked up to it first. All right, folks, so we got the good old uh, hood off there. Me and my wife actually managed to do most of it with the crane. We were just really careful with it. She helped steady it as I... It's sitting outside. Oh, as you, you will see here, the 9620 is sitting right here beside the shop now. I got a customer out there with an 821... B loader, case loader that I've got to do some work on. It was my wife right there. Anyway, um, there's sets. Uh, the customer that actually owns this truck we're working on currently. He's a really good guy. He'll help you out quite a bit. And I said, man, I really could use some help there if you could run that loader. And I'll run this grader. So I went and I, I kind of made a... I kind of... What I did is I... I tied off to, I made an A, kind of an A-frame out of the chain, and I got pretty close. I had the back of the grader probably from here to the bumper, and I told him, I said, I said, I'll be fine till I get to that hill. As soon as I get over the top side of that hill, I'm going to tie chain around that bucket, and you just kind of, just basically, you know, I would probably just more than likely just order neutral there and just kind of put your foot on the brake, and I'll just pull both of you down the hill you know i mean just kind of just kind of hold it back so anyway everything worked out fine we got it over here this morning and drug it out over the hill so we got her done i don't know what's i haven't heard anything about it they they called me the other day and was wanting to know <laughs> they they said hey you turned we've seen you turn something on the turbo on the video i i turned the impeller housing so the charger could have hose would hook up to it and everybody knows that that's not going to ever cause the, the cam to not turn anymore i mean i understand where they're coming from i'm not trying to be a jerk about it but you know i gotta tell you guys a little bit more as we go to working on this international here um i see here what do i need to take loose next as i'm thinking about this this hose here needs to come off because i'm just going to pull the condenser and everything as an assembly there was no refrigerant left in the system, so we, I was pretty certain that the air conditioner didn't work on this thing. We need to get the shroud loose and pop the shroud down over the fan. But anyway, um, not only do we have the mess going with the John Deere and that three-man engine that blew up there. and um, Oh, I just noticed. Look how they made the charger cooler specifically for this. Wow. That's different. Looks like to me they had enough room to clear that. Almost right there. I don't know if I'd have done that. I, you know, I don't know. Anyway, um, the Packard MX-13, that's another big mess. Um, so I in-framed that thing, and we never did... Well, we had it running a couple times, and it was fuel knocking. I mean, something... Something fierce. Um, let me get these bolts I pulled out of this hood support here. To... And then, okay, so it had fuel knock really bad, and it actually hydroed on us once. Hydro locked. So, the, the couple times we did have it running, you could put your foot on the floor, and it would run itself out of fuel. And what was going on, I had a six liter power stroke do this before to me. What it was doing is it was getting compression gas back in the fuel system and pushing the fuel back to tank. So you could 
then you'd have to prime it back up with that hand primer to try to get the fuel prime back up in it. And what was going on as well, when you hand primed it, you that, just on hand priming that fuel system, it was pushing the fuel into the head and pushing the fuel into the cylinder. And right away when I, when I thought that, I, I was skeptical about my, you know, I kind of screwed up there and I'm going to eat the injector. I told him, I said, I think we got an injector uh, sticking open. So we went and got an injector and a new fuel line and we stuck on it and it still did it. So then we thought, well, maybe the, maybe the injector ceiling washer on the end of the injector is not touching the bore. Maybe they machined the bore too deep because believe it or not, I talked to some guys that work on a lot more pack cars than I do and they said that they've seen quite a few of those done that way. So we, one of my good buddies down there that works on a lot of these pack cars, he said, just take two of them and stack them together and torque it down. And, and he said, that'll, that'll definitely tell you whether it's that or not. So we did that and still did it. So anyway, uh, I think what we got here, nuts on there, I can't really tell. I gotta get these off here. I gotta get the power steering reservoir off of here. Actually, that's the wrong bolts here. Um, so we did that and it still did it. And uh, finally, I told you know, here, here's how I found out which cylinder it was on. So those MX 13. EPA 10 models, which would be the older ones, they had individual pumping units, kind of like a Mac did. They had individual pumping units per cylinder. And I just started cracking the bottom line, so I got clear down to number six. And when I got to number six, I cracked the line and I had the bleeder on the filter head cracked. And I kept set there with a the remote starter switch, bump on the starter, and the compression was coming right out the bleeder. You know, you could crank on it. I mean, it was a lot of compression coming out the bleeder hole. So I I tightened one through five up and because it was on number six and then I I left number six loose and I cranked on it again and I still had compression. Then I tightened number six up and it went away. You know, so uh, no, what am I what am I thinking? I tightened up number six and it came back. I loosened it up and it went away. So uh so we knew that we had compression gas on uh number six cylinder getting into there and then we did the whole then we did the whole injector thing and copper washer thing and all that so either the cup is cracked or the or it's cracked behind the cup or i'm not really sure to be honest with you but long story short that outfit over there they don't a pack hard dealer didn't put it on so they're not going to do anything about it so you're, you're stuck with it. Tell you a story. I had a TW25 Ford tractor one time. I had a bad problem of getting water and oil. Kind of like this one. And that TW25 didn't have liners. It was a parent board block. Parent board means it's kind of like a gas engine. There's no liners. It's just a board block. So anyway, uh, tore it all down. I couldn't find where the water was coming from. I suspected electrolysis somewhere. So I sent the block up to Climb the Falls to a machine shop. And I told the guy, I says, I'm getting water and oil. Can you do whatever it is that you do? Pressure check it, whatever. Find a leak. Oh, yeah. So the guy, he takes it and... Mind you, this is the same guy that owns this truck right here that happened to this tractor. This is years ago. So, trying to, make, trying to make up my mind which end I want to pull off here. I'll get a 19 millimeter. here. So, um, he calls me and he says, yeah, I was pretty certain it was your head gasket, you know, leaking water down into the pan. So he researched, I said, okay. And it was a parent bore block, so we decided to bore it 20 over. Uh, I bought a kit, I think, from Ag Kits. Or, I don't even know if they were in business back then. I'm not sure. I got a, I got a kit for it anyway on online, and um, 
No, I'm wrong. He bought the kit from New Holland. And we got the 20 over pistons from New Holland. That's what it was. And, uh, anyway, I put it all together. You know, of course, it's a tractor. You gotta, you gotta split the, you gotta split the nose from the front of the engine. You gotta split the engine from the transmission. And, you know, it, it's a lot of work. It's a whole lot of work. It's, you know, 20, 30 hours worth of work just to get the engine off. Then you gotta strip the engine down to bare block. So, did all that work, got the engine fired up, that thing just started right up, just sounded beautiful. And uh, I shut it off, I only let it run for maybe 30 seconds, I didn't even, I, yeah I had antifreeze in it. Because I let it run for quite a while with the uh, oil, just oil no antifreeze in it. Well anyway, I I shut it off, checked the, checked the oil again, and it was just emulsified and just milk. And long story short, I pulled the head back off, ran a piston down the bottom dead center, still had water in the water jackets in the block, and when I ran the piston down the bottom dead center, when that guy bored it, he just made the electrolysis that was in the cylinder block worse. It was on number three piston, and water was just pissing right out the hole. You know, he opened up the hole even further, which I probably should have seen that when I was putting it together, but I didn't see it. You know, it's one of those things where you think it's fixed, and you're not really paying attention to that part of it, so you don't... Which I'm learning more and more in, in life that you got to check everybody's work. You got to check. I should have took that reman engine and tore it apart and torqued everything. You know, I don't know. What do you do? The only thing that could have caused what happened on that John Deere was that somebody didn't tighten something up and something on the front gear train, that's a gear driven camshaft, something came loose and the cam quit turning and then the crank got out of time with the cam. And it hit all the valves. I mean, there's there's nothing that you're gonna do by installing an engine and bolting four motor mounts on and a drive line and some wiring and plumbing that's gonna make the cam stop turning. So I mean, there's just anyway. Get back to my story on that before I go to ranting about the John Deere that pisses me off. And you know, and I'm not. I, I want to make this clear. The the dealer over here. Uh, I've known those guys and know a lot of those guys I've known them for years. I buy a lot of parts in there and I don't want to piss those guys off. They're good. They're good guys. They've always worked with me and treated me fine. You know, but I just hope, you know, deer themselves, Pape machinery. I've had really good luck with those guys. I, not only do I buy a lot of parts from there, I buy a lot of Kenworth parts. I, lot, I buy a lot of Cummins parts because they're a Cummins dealer in Klamath. I buy a lot of Cummins parts through them. You know, and, and I buy a lot of parts through the machinery side, too, on the construction side of things. So, you know, I don't... Why would you want to shoot yourself in the foot with the people you're getting parts from? I'm not I'm not trying to get anybody. I just want it... If, if, I, if I rebuilt an engine and sent it to somebody, and I can understand their side of... I can understand John Deere's side of it, too, because there are a lot of meatheads out there installing things that, you know, that do some really dumb things. It shouldn't probably be working on anything. I understand that. And they want to make sure that somebody didn't screw their engine up when they put it in. And I completely understand that. I mean, I understand that enough to where I don't really even like... I've had people... I've had people tell me they want to take an engine out and bring it to me and have me rebuild the engine. And then they'll go put it in. And I'm a little skeptical of doing that. And, and this is for this reason right here. You know? So... Part of me understands that. That's why I videoed it, to show that I didn't drop the engine. You know, I edited a couple of things where I smashed my finger and was cussing and screaming and hollering. I didn't put that in the video, but 99% of what I did, you know, I mean, not all of it. I didn't video the whole thing, but I, I pretty much videoed most of the main part of the installation. There's really not a... <laughs> There's really not a lot you can do to, to to really screw one up, you know? I mean, if you dropped it off the crane or something like that, of course you wouldn't put the engine in after that. You'd be, uh, you'd, probably be, you'd probably be going and looking for another engine again before you even got it in there. But. So I don't know what's gonna happen on the deal. I, I just, 
I'm going to tell you what I think. And I'm not trying to piss them off, but I know it's... I don't really know for certain where deer does their remands at. But more than likely, it's not done in the United States. It's probably done in Mexico or... somewhere else. And I don't know if they sent them out to... To load, I don't know if they bid them out to different companies, you know, I, I'm not sure how they do it. But obviously, we had one engine with a bad crankshaft. Now we got another one that the cam quit turning. So the track record's not that great. Just seen another problem here. This charge air cooler mount is just flopping around in here. We got to fix that when we go back together. But you know, the, the whole Peterbilt thing with the MX-13, you know, I these guys over here are trying to work with you. They know, you know, I mean, they'd be kind of shooting themselves in the foot too not to take care of it. They understand that. But on the other hand, if they, if they watched the video and you did something stupid that was completely your fault, yeah, I mean, yeah, you should. If, if I did something that was completely my fault, I have this thing called integrity. I wouldn't have even... I would have just called the owner and said, I really screwed up, man. I really screwed up. I got to fix this, you know. And I would have worked on that son of a gun until 2 o'clock in the morning fixing my screw up. But, you know, I knew it was nothing <laughs> nothing I did. So, anyway. All right, so I got the radiator and the... And the uh, all that stuff out of there. Kind of neat what they did there. They ran the drive line through the radiator. They cut it and built this tube here. It's kind of neat how they did that. Obviously the fan got into the radiator at one time or another. They've had that all fixed and put back together. Kind of a special radiator. You just don't go to the radiator shop and get one of those. Alright, so I had to pull the PTO drive line out of it because obviously it went through the radiator. So now, uh, really, I know I'm going to hear about it, but I, I've been pressure washing stuff off before bringing it here, but I just had my head planted up my rear end. I was in a hurry because I, you know, we messed around with that tractor. It's like, man, how much more time do I want to lose on that thing? You know, I need to get onto something that's actually productive. So I didn't even think about it. I just wheeled her in here. So we're going to get the blower nozzle and uh, blow this off real good and start uh, got to get the fan off. I guess we can go ahead and do that. Uh, what's going to be the easiest way to do that? Air hammer. I know what's going to be the easiest way to do that. I got a new air hammer sitting at home that one of my viewers sent me, Chet Ragsdale. I've used it a couple times, but I haven't really, really wanted to use it too much. This one's still working, so you know me, I don't give up on anything. And uh, one of the viewers, when I first made the video, went out and looked at this truck. Bill Knack is his name. He's a heavy equipment mechanic. Uh, if I remember, he's in New York. Good guy, man. I've known that guy for years. Known him. He was one of my. He's one of my first viewers. Me all kinds of stuff. We talk to each other over the years on the phone. But uh, Bill, he the other day when I was showing you about this, he called it. He said, "Yep, number six is leaking. I guarantee you." He was right. I this morning I pulled the pan on it, and sure as hell the number six was leaking. So I don't know if this is right-handed. Well, we'll go this way. I think it's right-handed. Or left-handed, I should say. It's starting to come loose. There 
she goes. So far, this GoPro Max, I'm pretty happy with it. It doesn't automatically freeze up on you and lose audio. And those GoPro 8s are the biggest pieces of shit I've ever had. The only reason I bought a GoPro 8 is because I had a GoPro 7 black. And that sucker was bulletproof. I ran over it with a backhoe, and I still filmed with it for another year. That's how tough that camera was. It always had good audio. I never hardly ever had any problems with it. And it finally gave up on me because I abused it. And then I bought the GoPro 8 and just... You know, I had Doug Dolezal sent me one of them too and I bought one. And they just... Both of them just were just junk, you know. Always something wrong with them. They'd lose audio or the battery would get to a certain percentage. And then the video would actually freeze up. It wouldn't play the video anymore, but the audio would carry on through. And I just, man, I got tired of dealing with it, and I told her, well, the eights are definitely a problem. I went through quite a bad spell there on all them eights that I was, that I had. Let me get my little light on my hat here, guys. Well, this one's kind of cool. It's got a pretty good viewfinder, and you can turn the viewfinder on to stay on and all that kind of stuff. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think times are going to get pretty tough here. Pretty soon. It's not looking very good, is it? What, what blows me away is some of these people can't believe that voted for this guy can't believe that gas prices are going up now they just can't believe it oh the gas price is just just unreal unreal injectors and then we got to pull the injectors because we're probably going to reuse the head I don't know we'll see what it looks like I'm so scared of machine shops and anything anymore I mean only there's an outfit over in Medford he's pretty good called Lem Big Machine he does really good work I haven't had any troubles with him so far I mean everybody makes mistakes but I had one outfit And I'm not a gasoline guy. I had this guy, he begged and pleaded me to work on a, a Mustang of his. A 60, a 65 or 66. Had a 289 in it. Anyway, I rebuilt the 289 for him. And uh, put it in there. And it was that was that winter we had like 25, 27 below zero for about couple weeks you know it was cold and uh went in there i'd started it the night before and i went in there the next day and it was it was cold man and well cold for here you know 25 below zero probably up there in canada it's just another day but it's colder than shit for here and uh anyhow the night before when I was running it, it, it just sounded really nice, man. I mean, it sounded smooth. Well, all of a sudden, I fired it up that morning and it started missing bad. Pulled it off. And again, I'll say I don't know much about them. Some of you gas guys will know a lot more about them. But I learned a lot real quick. At 289, Ford had pressed the rocker studs in. They were pressed into the cylinder head. And with the higher lift cam and stiffer valve springs we put in it, 
And I think in addition to the cold weather making everything shrink up, well, it just shoved the it shoved a bunch of the push rod uh, or the um, it pushed a bunch of the rocker pedestals right out of the cylinder head. Hold on, I'm gonna knock the camera off. I can tell already once I break that loose. So anyway, I got to looking at a couple of them, and I'd sent the heads off both heads to the machine shop. So I got to looking at a couple of them. And a couple of them were threaded. So I called over to the machine shop. And I asked him, I said, hey, uh, I see a couple of these are threaded. Did you guys do that? He goes, yeah, we, we fixed a couple of them while it was here on the bench. And I, he said, those, those like to come loose. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, so you had it on the bench, you had it all torn down, and you didn't do all of them? Oh, that's pissed off, you know, and then I I had to pull the heads back off and I really wasn't real competent or confident with You know, he said I could I could thread them right there, but I didn't really want to do it. I ended up pulling the heads back off and Took it to another machine shop because I was pretty pissed off about that with those guys I thought why would you have that sitting there on the bench and You know, this is a known problem with them and you don't do them all while you got it sitting there I just, I don't know. So I ate a bunch of time on that job, you know, because, you know, the machine shop couldn't do their job. But, you know, I'm not saying I'm perfect. You guys saw the 20, what was that, a 2390 case? Yeah, I screwed that up. I ate, I ate a lot of time. I, I probably lost five or $6,000 on that job. I ended up buying a $1,000 shaft for it, you know. I screwed that shaft up. So that's like, what I'm saying is, is when you do screw up, you just gotta say, well, I did that. But that seems, seems to be that most people can't seem to do that anymore. Let's see if it'll stay right here, maybe. Alrighty. Alrighty then. And they pack this over the bench, set them down. Get all the push rods out of her. really expect to see I mean like damage really on this one because it was running fine just water and oil just either electrolysis either electrolysis or which you know that's when you got to really start checking your ground straps like Bill was talking about check the ground to, to the block and the chassis ground that's I said that on a video some meathead Got on there, and he, you know, of course he knew everything. I think it was that K1650 dozer, and it had really bad electrolysis, and and, and it was grounds, you know, on the block, for, for bad. And he just, no, that, that's not going to cause that. Now, there, there's, there's, there's another thing that, there's another thing that causes... Well, something similar. Well, it'll it'll fool you. It's called liner cavitation, and that'll that'll sometimes look like electrolysis. But that particular thing was not liner cavitation. It was electrolysis, and he was he was going to tell me all about it, though. By God. I don't work for Packard, so I can't fix this. My gosh. 
lefty loosey righty tidy I gotta get all these turn lines off so I can get the so I can get the bolts out of the cylinder head because they're underneath them. Things of that nature. Well, basically, I gotta pull the other return lines off, and I gotta get all them bolts out of there, and so on and so forth. And then we'll uh, we'll uh, I'm trying to figure out where I'm gonna pick up on it at. I'll probably just grab it by the manifold or something. I don't know. I'll see if I can find somewhere to get a hold of it at, and. And uh, get her lifted off there. They're kind of a pain. What you do is you got to lift them. I don't know. I, I'm i lazy. I, I got too much crap going on. I don't want to pull the water pump. So I usually get them up and lift them over the top of the water pump. Well, we'll take her outside there and give her a good douche in there. And I set it on a block there so them injectors weren't sitting on the ground because we're going to reuse these. I mean, it was running fine. Um... I don't know. These are pretty cheap. They're just nozzles. We might just replace them. Well, we'll see how they come out. I mean, like I said, I've had some of them. I've had to beat them out the bottom. I took some of them to the machine shop, and they couldn't get them out. They had to beat them out the bottom, too. So, anyway. So, uh, let's see what we got here. Number six. What do we got? What do we got? Number six. Do we have electrolysis or a liner o-ring? I'm pretty sure it's a liner o-ring because yeah, it's a liner o-ring. I'm pretty certain because of where it was leaking when I pressurized it. It was running. It wasn't running out between the piston and the uh, between the piston and the liner, it was running out between the liner and the block. That's where the water was coming from. So it's a liner O-ring. So anyway, uh, here we are. Um, I'm going to get underneath and knock that number six out at least and get number six out of there and see what it looks like. One in my cab in my truck there and it's eight o'clock. So I'm going to roll her up and head home. So eight o'clock at night. So, uh, we've put in a long day. Come back tomorrow and I'll knock all these pistons liners out. I know it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a liner ring because that's where it was, it's not electrolysis. So, anyway, um, gonna get a kit coming for this thing. Uh, might ought to, well, maybe I'll rip those bearings, rod and mains off tomorrow. Because it had a lot of water, so we better check them and make sure that we're not going to have a problem. Yeah, you know, I hate to order all standard bearings and everything and then pull up the rod and main caps off and figure out that I got a screwed up rod or, a, you know, a screwed up main bearing or something and the crank screwed up. So, had a lot of water and it wasn't knocking or anything. He drove it in here like this, which I don't know if I'd have done. I think I'd have towed it in here with that much water and oil. So, anyways... Well, guys, uh, and then I got Don's engine over here. I got all the parts for that. I got to, we're going to try to finish stripping the DT-466 down tomorrow and get the uh, liners and pistons out of it and get some rod and main caps off this. And Don's engine, I need to pull these clutch plates the rest of the way apart. They're probably fine. Those wet clutches, they're pretty tough. But um, I got a video footage of me working on this i just haven't had time to upload it the only thing he's not going to have is he's going to have to get an aftermarket tack on this engine because here's the the old engine i'll show you out here i left this one outside i mean it's not that big a deal i mean they're not going to pick it up and carry it off i guarantee that but see how you got this there's the, the cam has a gear on it 
and then there's another gear that's vertical this the cam runs this gear and this gear runs this the tack drive and they put the gear on the cam on this 50 series engine but they didn't see there's the gear for the cam but they didn't put the boss and machine this part of this to put the other gear in there so i took that plate off thinking oh man yeah we could probably just put that on there well it ain't gonna happen no way so um i'll uh he's gonna have to get an aftermarket tack and put in there to run his that's, that's all I, that's about all i can do that i can think of or you you can get you can tack get tacks that run off the alternator too so anyhow tomorrow's another day thanks for watching guys